Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. So it's the 17th of April 2019 and I just wanted to pop in and ask for a favour from you all today. You may have seen my posts on social media about this or read yesterday's newsletter, so I'll be quick. Please would you vote for Stitchery Stories in the British Podcast Awards, Listener's Choice Awards. It's really easy to do. Just visit www.britishpodcastawards.com and British Podcast Awards is all one word. Click vote on the top of the menu and then type in Stitchery Stories in the search box and it's down as two words. So it finds it, it'll pop up and then you simply add your name and email address. Check the tick box to confirm that they can store your details to vote and then click submit. Oh, by the way, you don't have to join their email list to vote and you can only vote once. Voting closes at five o'clock on Wednesday the 15th of May and if you know anyone who is a fan of the show or just a fan of embroidery and textile art perhaps, you can share and encourage them to vote too. I really appreciate your help and I hope we can really lift the profile of textile art, embroidery and our lovely guests by doing well in this award. So thank you very much and now let's get on with today's show. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Emma Broughton. Hi Emma. Hi C. It's lovely to speak to you today. Now I've got a little bio here from Emma. So Emma Broughton is a graduate of both the Royal School of Needlework in 2009 and the University of the Creative Arts in 2012. She's also the author of the soon-to-be-published book Embroidered Boxes and that's coming out on the 22nd of April. Under the name Fairy Wren Embroidery, she will soon be teaching embroidery and box making classes and also offers a wide range of embroidery kits and undertakes commissions with her unique designs. Embroidered box making is her true passion because it combines her love of embroidery with 3D construction. And I'll do the links now because I've been terrible recently and keep forgetting them. So you can find Emma on fairywrenembroidery.com. You can find her on Facebook under Fairy Wren Embroidery and also on Instagram and it's fairy underscore wren underscore embroidery. But again, Emma's links will be in her episode on stitcherystories.com. So there we are. I think actually I've remembered to do everything before I even got going. Hooray, yay me. <laughs> right, uh, welcome again, Emma. Thank you. Before we get started with the nitty gritty of your stitchery story today, would you like to share with us what you are working on and what has got you excited? Right, well, see, at the moment I am working on an introduction to embroidery box kit and I'm also looking to start a silk shading on um, a fair, or a fairy wren bird which has been in my sort of to-do pile for mm. a little while um, and obviously I'm quite excited about the fact that my book is going to be published soon. Yeah the time's counting down for that now isn't it? So, it is. Yeah so you're on the last um, so so what's going on then with your with your book at the moment so obviously it'll be done are you just waiting for the publishers to do whatever publishers do? Yes, so they sent me my advance copy a few days ago, which was very exciting. Oh, that looked really exciting. Yeah, it was. Yeah, my husband took loads of photos because he was working from home when I opened it. <laughs> so um, he wanted to record the moment because obviously it's quite special. Yeah. Um, and it was very exciting. I'm so pleased um, because it's all my work. I took all the photos myself um, and obviously all the, the text and everything and all the designs are all my own so so yeah so it's very exciting yeah so that's been a true labor of love then so it um, 
photos. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And I'm, you know, I'm really pleased that he was taking photos as well because you can't recapture those moments, can you? Once you've seen your book for the first time, that's it. You've seen it next time. You've seen it for the second time, and it's just not the same. So, yeah, that was really lovely. So you've got plenty of things that you can be using to, um, yeah, just keep excited about your book, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Well, I have to say, um, Emma sent me a few photos and images out of the book and it really really does look lovely so I'm, I'm quite quite enthusiastic about the content so let's let's dive in a bit more Emma into basically the story of what made you decide you were going to write a book well I'd seen um one of my friends um Sophie Long she's written a book on ribbon work embroidery and oh. I bought that not long after it came out and it looked absolutely amazing. It's really good, great step-by-step photos. And I just thought, you know what, why can't I do that? That's what I've been trained to do is Mm -hmm. to do, you know, technical embroideries. And I had a lot of time free to to do it because my son was just starting preschool and so I just emailed the publishers and said, would you be interested in a book about embroidered boxes? Because there isn't really any other books that have really good step-by-step photos. And two weeks later, I was signing a contract. Wow. Two weeks. Two weeks yeah. after sending an initial email about a book proposal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, that it is, was so that is quick. amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I was really lucky because the initial reply went into my junk box. <laughs> yes, so I nearly it missed it. it. <laughs> um, so I literally only had a couple of days to get the synopsis back because she wanted to show her manager. Yeah. Or by a certain date, so I was literally writing my synopsis in the car <laughs> when we were dropping my in-laws off on their two-week cruise, and then when they were coming back, I was able to tell them that. I was actually going to be an author. Wow. Yeah, that's, that, that really is because, you know, traditionally we, we hear of people battling forever to try and get anybody interested in their book. And, you know, and that's really why things like Kindle, pub, you know, self-publishing on Kindle has become so popular because it really opened up book publishing to kind of anybody who wanted to write a book. So, to you know, to get somebody interested and to have got – from proposal to to contract in two weeks is is absolutely astounding it really is well well done you thank you had you thought about the the content of the book beforehand or you know were you able to give a reasonable outline or was it a case of hey do you, are you interested in a book about embroidered boxes and then it was like oh I better better start making something up now <laughs> Well, a little bit. I had some ideas um, in my head about how I was going to approach it. Yes. But um, having looked through Sophie's book, I then changed my ideas um, and they fed back to me after my initial email um, and said, I think you need to approach it slightly differently. I don't think people are going to be necessarily that interested in having boxes for specific people Mm. um because that's my initial thought was like boxes for children boxes for men um just sort of scale it back a little bit because they like having projects yeah so it was more a case of like different lid styles right different types of box construction what extra things you can add to your boxes like mirrors and locks as well so so yeah so then I had to after the first email had to really think very carefully about the way I was going to lay it out and obviously it was all things you kind of go into it with like a set list of things that you'd like to have in it Mm -hmm. and then when you realize quite how much work it's going to be (laughs) you have to scale it back slightly so there were some things that I would have loved to have got in it but I had to kind of take it back a bit so it wasn't too much. Well, that that is all an essential part of book planning, of course, isn't it? And the other way to think about it is that means you've got material and ideas for, for book two, haven't you? <laughs> you don't have to cram everything into book one. <laughs> well, I'd like to say there would be another book um, <laughs> on boxes, but I think I've pretty much covered everything that is essential. Right. Um, the extra bits were more things like I wanted to dye my fabric. 
Yeah. But realistically, that was never really going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, so I've got all the main elements in there. Right. Um, so there's a very good chapter at the back with lots of advice about how to design your own boxes. So really what I want is for people to read through the book and then not just copy yeah. my pieces, but actually design their own. Right. Cause I think that for me, that is what I want to be able to see out of it is I want to see that I've helped people design their own boxes. Brilliant. Yeah. So then people can take what they've learned and off they go and create their own boxes. That, that'd be really lovely, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. I'd, um, I think I'd like to have a, a have a go. I'll, I'll stick it on my list of all these things I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've already got a project, you can design a box for a project that you've already done. And I think that's the good thing is that you don't have to specifically design an embroidery to go on it. Mm. You can use something that you've already got. So if you've got something that you don't necessarily just want to stick in a frame, then that's perfect. Yeah, actually, I do have something that's really nice that would do for something like that. Anyway, stop stop filling my head with ideas. <laughs> I've got to do. <laughs> Fabulous. Right, so I can see why the um, book project has got you all excited. Now, how, therefore, I mean, you mentioned there about being the, a graduate of the Royal School of Needlework and the University of the Creative Arts. So do you want to give us a, a quick zoom through your career so far, you know, how you got interested, who taught you, and, and then what's led you on that path to starting to run this as a business? So I actually started doing embroidery just from probably about the age of five Mm -hmm. um this is probably why I'm a bit slow saying this um my Mm -hmm. mum taught me everything really she she was just one of those people that has to have their hand in everything (laughs) yes does that make sense so so she taught me lace was I think the first thing that she taught me I've still got um, a little snake bookmark I've actually um, dedicated the book to her and she was one of the reasons why I also approached to to write the book really because yeah. before she passed away she was always on at me you know you really need to do something you've learned so much you've got so much to do yeah why why are you not doing it you know so that's really what spurred me on to do what I'm doing now there's just always been crafts and whether it's dyeing fabrics or doing beadwork, you know, there's just always been something. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much there's nothing that she didn't try. You try things and obviously she's passed on a great love of creativity and skills to you and, and how lovely for her to be there giving you a prod in a nice way to um get on and, and, and do other things as well so I think that's always wonderful that we get support from people yeah I'm yeah. sure she would be over the moon wouldn't she to see a book that you'd done yeah I'm sure she would be yeah, yeah. so what was the next steps then you know what what got you to the Royal School of Needlework Emma so I did a gold work class in my secondary school I'm not quite sure how it came wow. about <laughs> yeah I know it's seems... unusual isn't it, it... Yeah, it is. Um, I think my secondary school just over the summer, for some reason, I think they only did it one year, Mm -hmm. they did like a range of art clubs um, and gold work was one of those. And so my mum must have bit me on it because I don't I don't really remember how it came about you were just there I was just yeah I know I was just there so um and the person teaching me was a lady called Shelley Cox and she's a lovely lady um and she is actually a tutor still at the RSN yeah and so obviously after the class my mum spoke to her and this is how we found out about the RSN so all through school it was just kept coming back to me that this was something that I wanted to do Mm. My parents are both very supportive and pushed me to do it. So once I'd finished college, I applied to the RSN. The apprenticeship only takes about six people a year. Oh, right. So on my first attempt, I was unsuccessful. But they told me to go and do a foundation course and then reapply. Mm -hmm. So obviously during the final part of my foundation course I really focused on embroidery and working on my own designs just so that 
I had a bit more to show them when I went. Yeah, yeah. And then I got in the second time. Mm -hmm. So I feel really lucky because we as a group were actually the last group of apprenticeships apprentices so they'd still do similar courses with the degree yeah and um with the future tutor courses as well but obviously there aren't going to be any more apprentices right oh I didn't realize that because obviously we've had quite a few guests who've done gone through that gone through that route of being an apprentice uh, at the RSN so that is, gives you really just an excellent launch pad doesn't it and then the University of the Creative Arts. So what was that all about? I wanted a bit more studying. <laughs> yeah, I did. I just didn't feel quite ready to sort of start out on my own, as it were. Right. Um, and I just felt that although I loved the embroidery, I think I needed to learn something else that was a bit more relaxed mm-hmm. and just sort of take not really a change of direction because I still love embroidery yeah. but just something that's a bit more messy does that <laughs> does that make sense it, it totally does make <laughs> sense yes I think I think it's really nice actually that you then chose to say right okay let's have a look at something in it from a different lens from a different viewpoint yeah to say, learn learn a different approach possibly a different set of skills and things as well because as we go through life, we realise that the thing that we first learned isn't the only thing we're ever going to learn. And actually, as we go through life and collect more skills about everything, it makes us a more rounded person. And I think it's a bit, it is a big step to go out on your own. Um, so I can totally understand why you would think, do you know what, actually, I don't feel quite ready. If you didn't feel quite ready, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been a success, would it? No. You would have had that in the back of your head. Oh, that would have been a confidence thing. Oh, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. You know, so I think hats off to you for doing that. So what sort of other things did you learn there as as a complete contrast to the skills from the Royal School of Needlework? Well, so we we learned about dyeing, printing with fabrics, how to do things on the computer so you can print them out onto fabric. Right. Um, just a lot more painting and drawing skills that I think I didn't quite have um yeah have before so I think there's a way that I can use some of that in my work I just previously haven't had the time to mix both yeah and I think that's something that going on I'd like to try and experiment a bit more with using dyes and then putting embroidery on my own fabric and do you think it would extend some of the commercial aspects to your development and your work I think so I hope so Mm. I think people are always looking to learn new things I myself still go on classes Mm -hmm. day classes and things when I get the time and I like to learn new things I never I never want to stop wanting to learn yeah I think there's so much that you can take from other people's approaches as well yeah definitely so yeah so I think that would be a good a good thing to then be able to pass that knowledge on to other people yeah definitely that was interesting when you were saying about the embroidered boxes that you like doing those because it combines your love of embroidery and 3d construction so how did you kind of get into box making then to the point where you've got you know think right I'm, I'm, I love box making and now I'm going to write a book about it. So what was, the, what was your journey there towards box making? Well, so we did box making as one of the subjects in my apprenticeship. All right, yeah. And I really wanted to stretch myself. So my first box, we did like a little tiny gift box first, but my mm-hmm. first big box actually has two working lockable lids. Right, wow, two lids. <laughs> Two lids, yes. I didn't want to just do one. <laughs> I like picturing how things are going to be mm-hmm. and then working out how I actually make them. Yeah. So working out how to make the lids actually lock did take quite a lot of fiddling around and thinking, oh, well, the, the lock has to sit in the lid this way and then when you turn the key, it opens so it's got to fit into something else Yes. Yeah. so that it can actually lock. And then, then there's also how to make it look pretty as well. Yeah. So obviously, fabric when you when you cut it will fray. Um, so the lids actually have PMC silver um, lock covers just yeah. to neaten up the keyhole. Yeah. 
so there's lots of different techniques that you can bring into it so if you like doing silver clay then then you can um add little extra bits which make it even more personal to you yeah wow now that is that is interesting so yeah so i can see the development of of skills and as you say fiddling around with things thinking and setting yourself a challenge how am i going to solve this and then you come up with some answers and some designs there so right yeah. oh, that's that's really really interesting so you mentioned there about obviously your mum being a major inspiration to you over the years have you got any other particular people who stand out as being a, a major part I guess that first gold work class at school would um, would be a good starting point wouldn't it as well obviously when Shelley taught me that it just taught me the gold work it was just amazing um and then she actually taught me again on the apprenticeship right as well she taught us the both sides alike technique yes it's used usually in military embroidery and both sides of the fabric have to be exactly the same yeah but that just blows my mind does that (laughs) (laughs) i haven't attempted it myself but uh, yeah it looks fabulous it actually isn't as difficult as it sounds it's just a lot of patience Mm -hmm. and um you have to keep flipping the frame over so they were probably one of the quietest but noisiest classes (laughs) if that makes sense so (laughs) everyone was concentrating really hard and not really talking but every now and again you'd have a rhythmic sort of knocking of the frame on the trestles (laughs) so there would be six frames around the room being turned at the same time (laughs) I had a very good art teacher as well in school Mm. who introduced me to loads of really amazing artists that I've tried to use in my work still. So I tend to use like a lot of nature in my work. Um, I love Gaudi. I also like um, Chagall. I don't know if you've seen on my website, I actually did a stump work piece in my apprenticeship, which was based on Chagall's work. Yeah, Um, That is actually my sister. (laughs) <laughs> in the picture who is absolutely animal crazy right so then moving on from there then Emma obviously having done the apprenticeship you cover a myriad of techniques in great detail is there any that really stand out as your I mean, your favorite techniques and you know why, why do you like them so much I think I have to say definitely gold work yeah. it's just one of the first things that I started with yeah. and it's just so blingy yeah <laughs> I mean who doesn't who doesn't love gold I mean uh, other than embroidery my next favorite thing is probably jewelry so gold work is always something that I like coming back to yeah and um, I've, I've realized as well that recently <laughs> loads of my guests have all been people who love gold work have done gold work and I'm like right I've got, to, I've got to stop talking to gold work people it's just kind of happened you know like guests come along and I find reach out to people and between us we finish up with a, a you know a random schedule of guests and then I looked and I thought right everyone's talking about gold work <laughs> and it probably needs to go and find somebody who does natural dyeing or something next don't I as a as, a, as a, an antithesis of gold work but yeah it, it is lovely <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's such a nice technique that you can just use with other techniques as well. So it goes beautifully um, with boxes as well, obviously. It does. Yes. <laughs> it does, yes. Also, ribbon work is a really, really good, simple technique that goes well with gold work. Um, and I really, although we didn't learn that at the RSN, ribbon work is something that I'm really, really starting to enjoy right. doing because it, it's, it's quite quick. And it and it's also three dimensional as well, so you yeah. can build up quite a lot of layers as well, along with other techniques. So yeah, so I think ribbon work. Also, I love black work and white work as well. Yeah, with black work particularly, this sort of shading that you mm. can get. Yeah, there's some really lovely effects that you can get with that. Again, that's I should imagine a lot of planning of how to do that shading. It, it looks really fascinating. I, I, I am absolutely not going to attempt that at all <laughs> but nothing is to do without starting to do shaded black work but I do greatly admire all the, the work I see I know um Jen Goodwin's done quite a lot she was talking about that when um, when I was chatting to her so yeah there's some beautiful pieces about that yeah there are I mean there are some um slightly simplified versions that you can do as well which look mm-hmm. equally as good um and actually one of the pieces um one of the boxes from a book I actually just made it up 
as I went along the shading (laughs) so there wasn't a huge amount of planning in that I just wanted if if people have a look at the the picture um it's actually on the front cover yeah it's the door to my wedding card box um and I just wanted it to look naturally like wood so I think if I tried to plan the shading on that yeah it it wouldn't have worked as well yeah I know what you mean sometimes you just get in the flow don't you think right yeah I can see where I need to put some extra bits in there and change yeah. that slightly etc yeah I think I know the answer to this one, but what would you say has been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far, Emma? Well, I'd have to say you probably want to, you probably think it's going to be my book, but I think (laughs) um, studying at the RSN is probably one of the best things that I could have done. Yeah. Working in Hampton Court Palace as well. It's just amazing. And then obviously the book as well. And I can see why you would say, like going to the RSN, especially as you say, it took you two girls to get to get in there as well. So it was a, it was a real point for you, wasn't it? To say, right, I'm going to go and do my foundation course, and I'm going to do these things, and I'm I'm going to go and try again. So hats yeah. off to you for going back and trying again, and Thank then you. getting in. So yes, that that I could see that being a great highlight. And yes, obviously, creating a book is the highlight of anybody's. It must be, you know. It's, it's a thing, isn't it, writing a book? So, yes, it, I, is. it is definitely a highlight as well. It is, but it wouldn't have happened without all the years' hard work. Exactly. Um, studying at the RSN. So if it wasn't for that, then then it wouldn't have happened. So I think that's why I choose that sort of slightly more over the book because without that, nothing else would have happened. Exactly. And then what about your... Um, running your business, your, your fairy wren embroidery. Where, kind of, where did that? Where did that come from? Well, obviously, I finished the book now, so yeah. I have been wanting to run my own business um, and start up doing embroidery classes and teaching for a while. Um, but as with anything, you need the time and support to be able to do that. Yes. So I'm quite lucky that I'm in a position now that I can start to explore that. And it's still very much in the early days, but I'm hoping to have some classes running soon. So, right, because you you mentioned about your son being at preschool, so he, he must be in primary school, is he now? He is, yeah. He's yeah. in um, early years now, yeah. so I've got a bit more time to be able to put things together. So when he was in preschool, I only had 15 hours a week to be able to get things done. So I had to be very targeted with what yeah. I did. Well, I've been there with a the small child and lots of our listeners are as well. So it brings its own challenges, doesn't it? But I think the flip side of it, as I think um, Natalie Dupree was saying when I was chatting to her about this, is you know you've got a fixed amount of time when your kids are out of the house. So you really make the most of it to, to be able to develop develop that through. And so I think that's really nice. Like, So really then I think we can say you're – business is now going to launch on the back of the book as it were so you know that's yes. really going to give it a good focal point yeah yeah, yeah. and I hope yeah I hope to um have some box making classes up and running soon so gotta get working on the kits and things yeah there's um there's always such a lot to do isn't there but I think I think that's really great and when you've got that book and as you say you're encouraging people to design their own but it's also really nice to go to a class and I suppose box making is a sort of thing that you need a bit longer time you know you can't you do. do much <laughs> three hours on a Saturday afternoon can you kind of thing no no <laughs> it takes um for a small box um a good few days um depending on whether you've got a very detailed embroidery on it or whether just having a small initial or something quite simple yeah because you've got both sides haven't you you've got the the decorated however you're going to decorate it you've got to create yeah. that plus then you've got the construction and I guess you need to know how you're going to construct it before you start embroidering anything as well so yes yeah so yeah so a lot of planning does go into making a box as you say, kits, I think, would be a good idea for that then. And we've got everything that we need, but longer term workshops and so on would be pretty exciting as well to go to. So yeah. It's, yeah, it's that a special be... treat for me to go on a workshop because obviously I've got my child. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a, re- a really interesting way of doing it, Emma, is to, you know, do the book. and then. But again, you've been very, I think, purposeful in knowing what you can achieve in the time that you've got available to do it. Yes, definitely. 
Now, you've been very purposeful with your time, Emma. So do you have any of those dreaded unfinished objects lurking around in the back of a cupboard anywhere? That um, and Do you think you might ever finish it? Well, I've only got one thing embroidery-wise that I haven't finished, really. (laughs) Um, I've got lots of ideas planned. Um, I've got some half-finished crochet and I've got a half-finished sweatshirt um, as well. But I've only got one embroidery thing that I haven't finished, which I probably should (laughs) finish at some point, um, which is a family crest for my dad which was for his birthday yeah which I started when I was in the RSN but as these things go you have other things to do and I just never got a chance to finish it oh um so maybe one day we'll get back to that Uh, is there a is there a special event or a milestone that you can kind of aim for think right I'm going to get that done for him for x y and z reason (laughs) oh I don't know he's had his He's had his big birthday, so maybe his next big birthday. That would give me a few years yet to get it finished. <laughs> and, it, and that does bring to mind, we talk about unfinished objects. I think we've all got a big list in our heads of unstarted objects, haven't we? I have. I've got this enormous list of unstarted objects in my head. <laughs> yeah, I think that for me, that is more the case. That I've got a lot of things in my head that are sort of like half planned out but haven't actually started um I've got um a fairy wren bed that I've planned out and is ready to start once I finished my current project Mm -hmm. so I think that might have to be put off for a little while longer (laughs) and then one of the boxes from the book um I really wanted to try and do a star shaped box right but as with all things if you've got a limited deadline I think um it's just I had to put it to one side so that is something that I still really want to try and do right yeah but it's going to take a lot more planning than than I had time for yeah and I think that's why so isn't it sometimes to recognize think well hang on a minute um to do I really want to do this thing but I'm going to need all of this extra time I don't have that time can I can I can I give anything else up? The answer is usually no. Right. Well, let's just move ahead with what we've got and get something really nice done, rather than stressing ourselves with panic. And and you know you just don't want to you don't want to be in that space, do you? Really, it's it's not a good good way to go. So yeah, no. that's a good a good plan. And um, yeah. yeah, I can imagine a star shaped box being. Uh, another another level of planning on top of an ordinary box so, yeah. yeah yeah triangles are definitely <laughs> not um an easy thing to do so it may be that it's not possible it may be that I'm I'm thinking of something that isn't going to work but um you're now going I've got to have a bit more fun time. trying aren't you? yeah I'm gonna have yeah. fun trying yeah <laughs> now now the other thing obviously talking about um you were saying before about the amount of time that you had originally to you know get started and now you've got a bit more so um how do you organize your creative time emma is there any particular things that you like to do to keep yourselves creative and 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 just make space for you and and your life as well well um i just try and keep to a similar sort of routine so I get up quite early um, and try and fit things in before my son goes to school so or before he even gets up Mm. um, I try and fit in doing a workout um, because I I think that's quite important I've had injuries in the past so I need to make sure that I keep myself energized and I think it does actually help keep me energized for the rest of the day as well Mm. even though it might be hard at the time yeah it just helps give me that focus so when I do get the me time to do my embroidery work then I'm I'm already set up for the day I don't have to be spending the whole day thinking about I've got to do this I've got to do that yeah I find I mean I, I do get up early and I go running and you know and, and in winter you know you get half five you just think what the hell am I doing this for <laughs> I'm insane but even a good old run again you know, I, I live near the sea so I kind of go off down the seafront and uh, you know running along there it's dark and it's howling with winds because it's windy here and it's howling with winds and sometimes delightfully it starts to rain 
You think, what am I doing this for? But do you know what? You stick at it, you get back, and you just think, wow, that's it. I just, you feel just so different, you know, because I spend all my day sat in front of a computer and have done for years. So for me, I, I do just think, I, can't, I just can't bear to sit down anymore. I've got to, and, and even then I'll go for a walk on a lunchtime as well. I'll, I'll, I'll have my lunch and then I'll go, I've got a little, another circuit back down to the seafront again. Um, because otherwise you ache, or I do, yeah. you ache and you, you can't concentrate on what you're doing because you, you start to concentrate more about how, how much your leg aches or whatever. So, yeah, hats off to you for um, for fitting an exercise routine in. And, yeah, when your kids are young, sometimes that's the only time you can do it, isn't it? You get yeah. up, I've, that's why I get up so early to go running. It's a habit now for me, but that was like, well, Ryan's asleep and – you know, when I get back, then, you know, at seven o'clock, then I'll wake him up and we'll get ready for school, etc. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it does set you up for the day. Is there any other kind of things that you do to get more time? Well, I try and do things at the weekend as well, mm-hmm. if I can, if my husband lets me. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'd love to be able to do things with my son as well, but he's not interested. <laughs> I think it's maybe a boy thing. He doesn't seem to be interested. So he loves painting and things. So maybe I need to try yeah. and do a bit more of, the, more of that with him. Yeah. Um, but the embroidery is, it's all got to be when he's, he's um, at school. Yeah, yeah. Really. So yeah, just try and squeeze in as much as I can in the time that I've got. And, and obviously you've done, you know, you've done a good job of that because you've got a book out, a book out yeah. the door. So well, well done on that one. Thank you. So as we as we're moving t- towards the end, Emma, um, obviously your book's coming out on the twenty second of April, yeah, uh, Easter, the Easter weekend, basically. So yeah. have you got any um, other future plans and projects that you might want to just share with us as we um, as we quickly finish today? Well, as I said before, I'd quite like to get some classes and workshops up and running. Yeah. Um, so I've got a lovely um, venue near me, which is the Farn and Malting. So I'm hoping, as they do quite a lot of workshops, that I can start doing some there. And then maybe in the future, hopefully, have a big enough garden to have a studio outside. Yeah, oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Lots of people yeah. have got um, studios in, in kind of... Nice, nice sheds. Let's put them, call them nice. Yeah, sheds. yeah, yeah. Nice sheds. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a very common dream of <laughs> people. I'm sure a lot of people will be nodding their head, going, "Yeah, I'd love a really nice workshop in my garden as well." So, yeah, fabulous. Right. Well, we'll all be keeping our eye out for your book, and it's called Embroidered Boxes. And um, yeah, we'll all be keeping an eye out for that, and keep looking out for any of your classes and kits and what you're doing. If we follow. Emma on Facebook and Instagram then we'll be able to keep up with what she's doing and any of her activities around your book launch uh, kits and all the rest of it so so there we are Emma thank you so much for sharing your stitchery story with us today really really enjoyed chatting with you and I'm feeling quite excited about um, adding embroidered boxes to my unstarted projects list as well (laughs) well thank you for having me Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Emma. All right, then you take care. You too. Thanks. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and information around this podcast. Please visit stitcherystories.com. Of course, you can listen to Stitchery Stories on plenty of podcast apps, at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and plenty more besides. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Stitchery Stories podcast too. But wherever you listen, why not leave us a rating and a review to encourage other people to listen too. I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that for me. So that is the end of our Stitchery Story for today. Keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery Stories.